Hello, I'm Michelle Tapper with the latest from science. Around one in five Australians suffer from a mental health disorder. And as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, experts say mental health problems are only going to get worse. Joining us today to discuss these issues is Academy Fellow Professor Patrick McGorry. He's a psychiatrist and executive director of Origin and Professor of Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Michelle. Pat, mental health is often difficult for people to talk about, but at this point in the pandemic, it seems that nearly all of us are being affected or we know someone who's being affected by anxiety or depression. What does the latest research show? I guess the latest research is, um, shows is a series of surveys mainly uh, so far. That's, that's the sort of research that can be done in a short time frame. It shows surging levels of distress and mental ill health across the whole population. Now, um, as with any disaster or crisis, there are variable levels of exposure of, pe of people to the crisis. But in this case, almost everyone's been exposed in some way, even though it's a bit variable still. Um, so everyone is really more conscious and more personally and viscerally probably aware that, that mental health is quite fragile, actually. And, and um, they probably knew that intellectually before. And obviously, five million Australians every year are affected by mental ill health. So it, it was a widespread uh, feeling before, but it's really gone to another level now. And I think that's worrying people quite a lot. Now, there are varying degrees of mental health problems. What would your advice be to people who are suffering from general anxiety or depression? I suppose the first thing to say is that just because we're not feeling good and, and we've, lo we've lost a sense of well-being and, and uh, maybe we're, we're more anxious and, and, and with lowered mood compared to our normal selves, it doesn't mean we all need to be rushing out to, to see mental health professionals. The majority of people are going to be okay through this, through this disaster and crisis. However, a substantial minority will not be, and it's going to be a significant surge on top of what's normally the case. So the, the, the trick is really to work out when you actually need to reach out for help. And, and pr pr probably some, some um, tips there would be helpful, such as if, if, if the feelings of lowered mood are, are deep um, and worrying uh, and associated with suicidal thoughts or deep pessimism, um, or if they're causing intense distress and emotional pain that is difficult to cope with, or if they persist, especially if they persist over a, a period of many days or even weeks, that's the time to really say, actually, I've crossed the line here and I need to, to tell someone about this and, and, um, <clears throat> and actually reach out and seek help, professional help. Now, you're based in Melbourne, which is still in stage four lockdown, and obviously people there are doing it tough and it there does seem to be no end in sight. What is your advice for Victorians at this point? Well, I think um, with, with the severe lockdown, the stage four lockdown that we're experiencing in Victoria, um, obviously it's, it's more uh, liberal in other states at the moment. Um, that's a problem because the normal ways of coping with, with stress like this uh, and uh, a disaster or a crisis um, is to actually um, rely on your normal coping mechanisms. That might involve exercise, it might involve um, social contact, um, getting social support from other people, um, and also having a sense of, um, of when the problem is going to end. I think the, the open-ended nature of this is, is really affecting people, the uncertainty. Um, and of course, then there's the practical consequences of no meaningful social role for many people. Um, if, if they're unemployed or their education has been disrupted, all the sort of things that we normally rely on to get us through the day and to get us through life uh, are being restricted or, or not available. So, so it's a bit of a double whammy, actually. We, we've got this massive crisis, and then the normal sources of, of uh, coping with such crises are, are removed at the same time. So, so that's the problem for us here in lockdown. Um, there are some signs of light at the end of the tunnel, though. Um, the, the numbers are decreasing again, and we believe that the lockdown will be eased fairly soon. But um, uh, I think it's been a pretty tough time. And I'm, what I'm worried about more than anything else is the economic collapse that's, um, that's beckoning. If, if that cannot be avoided or softened, then I think that's where we're going to see a real surge of, of mental ill health and risk of uh, rising suicide rates. In your opinion, do we have enough mental health services to cater to this increased need? And what needs to be done to help people? 
Well, this is where there's a massive contrast be between the, the, uh, the response in a physical health sense to the infectious disease pandemic. Um, uh, the physical health system, the general acute hospital system and the health system generally is incredibly well resourced uh, by comparison compared to, um, to, to the mental health system. Even pre-pandemic, we knew that the mental health system was in crisis. We have a Royal Commission here in Victoria because of that. The, the Premier has described the system as broken in this state. Um, we've had a Productivity Commission inquiry at the federal level looking at the serious underinvestment in mental health care across Australia. Um, so our system was um, absolutely overwhelmed even prior to the, the pandemic. And, and now we have a surge, we predict around 20 to 30% of new cases, new need for care coming down the pipe in terms of mental, mental health care. So we have a, a really significant health uh, crisis here in mental health. Um, the system was already under tremendous pressure before, and, and uh, now we, we, we're expected to, to respond uh, to this, this new surge. So uh, I think governments really need to get their heads around that. So it seems we're in a pretty dire situation. Now, Pat, suicide is something that's not often discussed, but the fact that it is the leading cause of death in people aged 15 to 44 in Australia is shocking, and there are around 3,000 deaths a year. Do you think we're going to see a rise in these figures and what can be done to prevent it? The Prime Minister had actually understood the seriousness of this, this uh, public health uh, threat by appointing a suicide prevention advisor, Christine Morgan, even prior to the pandemic. So uh, I think he, he and the government are concerned about this and they have taken some positive steps in this regard. The media are doing very well with suicide. Um, they're reporting it more prominently. It was on the front page of um, uh, Sydney newspapers over the weekend, the cluster of suicides in Sydney. So I think it, that is an issue that's really coming out of the shadows and, and breaking through the taboo that's been around for so long. Um, so far, there is good news. Um, there has not been, as far as we can tell, a, a rise in suicide numbers above the already way too high level. So that's that says that we've still got time to act to prevent the, the rise that, that's actually predicted. Uh, scientific modelling from the University of Sydney and the University of Melbourne have, have predicted a rise in suicide in the, in, the, in the context of the pandemic, but it's probably got a lead time and we do have time to act to reduce that risk of, of rising suicide rates. The biggest driver of those rising suicide rates is a combination of two things. One is the economic recession that's, that's uh, underway now that's probably the most potent one. And the lack of mental health services uh, that, that I mentioned a moment ago, that, that the, the failure of, of governments to, to build a system that's um, at scale and fit for purpose is, is the other big threat there. If those issues are addressed, and I think federal and state governments are starting to do that and, and um, you know, really applaud the early actions they've taken there, but they've got to take this very seriously and build a system that's fit for purpose and at, at scale. And they've also got to soften the economic effects um, of the pandemic on, on, the, on the general public. It sounds like the worst is yet to come. The, the, the suicide predictions show that the, the rise in suicide risk will gradually build up over the coming months and, and will last for years. So yes, the worst is yet to come if we don't do anything about it. But uh, the, the, the really good news is we've got time to do that and, and governments are waking up to this fact. Um, um, the Prime Minister, the, the Premier here in this state, it's, it's, it's at the front of their minds now, whereas I think um, in the past it was uh, pretty much uh, down the pecking order. And what is the economic cost of mental health problems? We currently spend about 7% of the health budget on a problem that's, that's worth at least 14% and probably even more than that of the health burden. So we're, in Australia we're spending a, a, probably less than half of what we really need to spend. I'll just give you a comparison. We spend $22 billion a year on 400,000 people with physical disability through the NDIS. We spend 10 billion a year on 5 million Australians with mental ill health. So the mismatch is, is, is extraordinary. The Productivity Commission really nailed this because they show that we spend $10 billion on, on direct health care, which is a, a significant underspend. And the cost of, of that underspend actually result in, in losses of $130 billion a year to the Australian economy. And worldwide, the World Economic Forum has shown that 35% of loss of GDP caused by non-communicable disease is explained by mental illness. 
and something like 18% is explained by cancer. So mental illness is twice as important as cancer in terms of its impact on the economy. And finally, Pat, what should people do if they or someone they know is struggling with mental health problems? If you yourself or someone very close to you is struggling with, with mental ill health, the most important thing you can do is actually acknowledge it and get over that natural reluctance we have to seek help. And, and the way to do that is, is, is to go through pathways of trust or pools of trust, as we say. Talk to someone that you trust. And if you're fortunate enough to have such, such people in your life, most people do, but reach out to someone that you can trust and then try to get, ask them to help you or if you're, in the, if you're that person, help, help your relative or friend to, to find um, a competent mental health professional. Via primary care is probably the, the best way in at this stage. Um, but um, shop around, try to find the best person that you can and, and someone that you actually can relate to and engage with and who also has the skills to help you. That's not an easy task because of the underfunding and, and the, um, the pressure on the system. But it's very important to persist with that so that um, it could save your life. It could, and it certainly is, is, is the right thing to do. Thanks for all that great advice, Patrick. We really appreciate your insight. Professor Patrick McGorry, thanks for your time. Thanks, Michelle. And don't forget, for regular video updates from the Australian Academy of Science, make sure to follow us on social media. I'm Michelle Tapper. See you soon.